Hey everyone, thank you for joining us for today's service. I'm Pastor David Freeman at Jubilee, and we are honored to have guest speaker Derek Gast with us today. He shares on abundance, a perspective of prosperity. You know, God blesses us. What are we supposed to do with it? What is a healthy perspective of prosperity? I hope you enjoy today's service as Derek shares with us from the Word of God, a perspective of how God can bless us and how we are to take that and use that in our everyday life. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> good morning, guys. It's good to be here. I, I love being at Jubilee because I can tell um, very quickly that you guys have a love for the Word and a love for the presence of God. And, and with those two things, you can't really go wrong. Um, yeah, my name's Derek. I live in Calgary. My wife is Taylor. And uh, we just spent uh, two and a half months um, kind of mainly in Iraq, doing some missions, and we just got back this week on Wednesday and uh, have just lots of stories of God's goodness and, and seeing God do incredible things and uh, God just really um, working a lot in our hearts and in our lives. Um, hopefully sometime Taylor and, and I can, can share more about what we saw in Iraq, um, but yeah. I've got I've got a word today on on abundance. So, but hmm, Tay, do you want to share one quick story? No, it's okay. We went to this one camp. There was like fifteen thousand Syrians who had, who had been there for like three years, and uh, I mean, there was just probably like ten camps just in the area that we were by. Has anyone heard of Mosul on the news? Yeah, so that's like modern day Nineveh. That's where Nineveh used to be. And so there's obviously a huge battle going on in Mosul um, against ISIS. And uh, we were about 45 minutes from there living. Uh, and then the camps were um, kind of around the area because there's just hundreds of thousands of people coming out of the Mosul area. And uh, we were at this one um, Syri- Syrian camp and uh, we were praying for this girl who was um, deaf and she was mute. And she was a Muslim and had a Muslim family. And there was all these people with great faith in there. I was like, oh, this is going to be so awesome. We're just praying up a storm. This lady's going to be healed. And, and everyone of her family is going to come uh, to, to Christ. This is going to be awesome. Uh, and we were going for it. And we kept on praying. And we kept on praying. And we didn't really see anything happen. And I, I left there quite like disappointed, to be honest. I was like, man, if there was ever a time that God should like <laughs> come and do something, that would have been a good time. Uh, and then maybe four days later, uh, we heard we got a call that um, after we left, she had signed to her sister, um, kind of using her sign language, that while we were praying, she saw this man in white come uh, to her and he showed her the scars on her hand and uh, and she he touches her head and there was something that the doctors had put in her head a long time ago to try and help her but it actually just made things worse and it just caused a lot of discomfort and she felt that God was taking it away and uh, and when she started to say the the name Yeshua and so we're just believing that God's continue we need to do some amazing works in Iraq, and uh, we have many stories of God's goodness, and just have, um, yeah, just are so grateful for our time there. Um, would you agree that our God is a God of abundance? Yes. yes. The word abundance means more than enough, overflowing a large quantity of something. You know, God has abundant creativity. If you just study how the body works, you'll be blown away. You know, God is abundant in majesty. Just look up at the stars. God is abundant in love. Just look at the cross. And I loved that verse that Jocelyn read this morning. You know, it's beyond our knowledge. That's how much love he has. In Psalms, God says that every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. He's he's a God of abundance. And and the story of Jesus, this is his first miracle, uh, when, when he turned w- water into wine, um, I grew up in a home where we didn't have alcohol, like any alcohol around. And this one always used to baffle me. I was like, man, why did Jesus just like make so much wine? I mean, like he didn't just like make a little wine. He made like barrels and barrels and barrels. And t- to be honest, I was quite offended. 
<laughs> and really, there's, there's no really great explanation besides he's a God of abundance. He just, he just does things to the fullness, and, and he made amazing wine, and he made a lot of it. And if you look at um, his other miracles of multiplication, uh, feeding the 4,000 and the 5,000, uh, there's, there's a lot of food left over. He doesn't just, just feed the people. There's, there's extra. It's amazing. Our God is a God of abundance. And, and today we're going to be talking about, as you guessed, abundance. nice abundance. And, and now I want to be careful to have you understand that I'm not preaching uh, prosperity gospel. And, and so I want to take a few minutes right off the top to unpack that. And so this is this, the kind of more theological part of the message. And then we'll get into the more practical implications. Um, but if you look at most of the strong theological disagreements in Christianity, they're not because a thought is biblically incorrect. It's normally because they're biblically one-sided. People are camping out on one side and not understanding the fullness of the scripture and how they work together. So, so for an example, uh, the old Calvinism and Arminianism debate. Are you guys familiar with this one? Yes. I mean, in, in a really very simplistic general view of Calvinism, it, it's saying that God knows and has planned everything that will happen. Everything is predestined. God is sovereign. And, and you know what? All their points at one time or another can be supported biblically. And then you have the other side that says man has total uh, and complete free will. And you know what? All their points can be supported biblically at one time or the other as well. And, and so they argue back and forth and, and they pull out different, different scriptures. Um, but the reality, I think, is that both are true. And, and we think, how can that be? How could God be completely sovereign while man has complete free will at the same time? And it's, and it's beyond our human understanding. Um, but, but I love the example of the cross. And on the cross, God's sovereignty and man's free will come together. Man in free will crucified Jesus. We, we did it. Those, those soldiers did it. Those people yelling crucify him did it in their free will. They wanted him dead. But it says in Acts 2 verse 23 that it was God's predestined purposeful plan all along that this would happen. And in that moment, you have God's sovereignty and, and man's free will coming together and, and, and existing at the same time. And uh, this quote that I've really liked, um, my wife told it to me in the summer. It's, it's a quote that says, it's not either or, it's both and more. It's a fun little, fun little quote. Do you guys want to say that? Ready? It's not either or, it's both and more. Yes, wow, what a fun little saying. You know what, that's actually like, if you're ever just like trying to think about something biblically, and there's kind of like two sides of the argument, just, just consider that quote for a moment. Um, something, something might click. Uh, and the topic of abundance and blessing um, is also one that can cause a lot of debate. I mean, Jesus says the enemy comes to kill and destroy, but I've come that you may have abundant life. And we can all agree on this. Our God is a God of abundance. The problem is, is that we don't necessarily agree on what that abundance looks like, you know, or what abundance means. Especially in, in some American churches right now, there is a strong presence of what is known as the prosperity gospel, which basically says God loves you and wants you to prosper and bless you. And, and if you obey God, your life is going to get good. And oftentimes it involves financial blessings as well as, as they teach. And, and you know what? This does have scripture to back it up. Um, Deuteronomy 28 is a chapter in the Bible known as blessings and curses. And the whole premise of the whole chapter is that if you are obedient to God, you will be blessed in many ways. And if you are disobedient to God, you will be cursed in many ways. And so I'll just read you a little bit of this. This is Deuteronomy 28. It says... This, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed and the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. Anyone got some flocks? They're going to get blessed. <laughs> Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. 
The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but flee from you in seven. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns. Man, if you're a farmer, you're just getting all the blessings. And on everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he has given you. And he keeps on saying these blessings. And then he, he, he uh, says a bunch of curses uh, if you disobey God in that chapter as well. And I think we all agree that, that ultimately in the long run, obeying God is going to bring life. And not obeying God is going to bring death. I mean, in general, following uh, the Ten Commandments is going to help you in life. I mean, not murdering someone is generally a good thing. It helps you uh, in life because you're not stuck in prison. Or uh, if you want to have a healthy family uh, and, and marriage, not committing adultery is is a very important part of that. And and you see that that following God's laws um, bring life. Um, and so you can kind of see what they're saying. But, but what's, what's the flip side? What's, if that's one side, what, what's the other side of, of the equation? I mean, can you imagine trying to sell the disciples or Paul on the prosperity gospel? It would be a little difficult. Why? Because look at their lives as Christians. I mean, imagine if Jesus had said to his disciples, Hey guys, come follow me. It will make you rich. You'll be able to buy that nice new fishing boat. Or, hey guys, come follow me. It will be comfortable. He didn't say that. He said, leave everything behind for my sake. He said, pick up your cross and follow me. He said, because of me, you will undergo many persecutions. He didn't say, blessed are the comfortable, for they will be even more comfortable. No, he said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And if you look at how all the disciples died, it's hard to get behind the prosperity gospel. I mean, Peter was killed on a cross upside down. Andrew was scourged and tied to a cross. James was beheaded. Philip, Jude, and Simon were crucified. Thomas was speared to death. Bartholomew. <laughs> Let me try that again. That was Bartholomew. Nice. Okay. I thought I was going to struggle for at least four times for your entertainment. Uh, Bartholomew was thought to be skinned alive. Crazy. Matthew was stabbed, and James the less was stoned. And, And besides John and Judas, all the disciples died violently for their faith. And when we were in Iraq, one of the most significant moments uh, for me was was meeting in in house churches of local believers that were being persecuted for their faith. When we were in Erbil, um, in general, it's okay to be a Christian. It's quite it's probably the most liberal place in all of Iraq. Uh, but this one time we went to a city called Kirkuk, just an hour away, and uh, in Kirkuk. Um, it's a very um, Islamic place, and uh, actually ISIS had just um, done a whole bunch of stuff there the, the week prior before we went, and uh, it was a little scary. Um, but we went to this, this family's home, and they had become Christians. They were uh, Muslim background, and uh, it, was just, it was just incredible hearing their stories, and such an honor just to, to meet with them. And it's like, wow, this is, this is really what, what church is. Like, we're having a meal with these people. We're encouraging one another. We're, we're just building each other up. We're praying for each other. And, uh, I mean, after they had become Christians, the, their life didn't get necessarily better from what we would view better as being. I mean, their family had completely disowned them. Their family had given them threats. Um, they just didn't feel safe. Um, th- their lives had, had really, in a lot of ways, um, not been blessed. But yet these people knew Jesus, and, and they had an abundant life, and they had been blessed. And, and I'm, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more. Uh, another place we went to was um, in this one refugee camp that we spent a lot of time in. And it was an Arab refugee camp, and most of the people were Sunni Muslims in that camp. And uh, we met with uh, these three brothers in this tent, and they had just recently become Christians. And it's the very same story. Um, they had lost everything they had in, in Mosul due to ISIS. And so they were living in this camp. And now in this camp, because they had become Christians, um, 
Once again, they had lost even more. They'd lost their community. All the people around them wouldn't talk to them. They would, uh, when we were there actually meeting in their tent, um, one of the brothers couldn't come in because the parents uh, of the surrounding tents, they had instructed their kids to throw rocks at this tent. They had instructed their kids to, to make trouble. And, and so one brother was standing outside his little tent trying to protect it from like literally being broken. Um, and we were inside the tent um, worshiping, and, and the Muslim call to prayer is, is going on, and it was such a, like a surreal moment. And there's a little heater, one little light, and, and we're opening the word together. And in, in those moments, you realize, wow, like Christianity is so much more than, than what we see in the Western world. You know, when, when we get a global view of Christianity, we, we start to understand things um, that, that Jesus taught. I mean, when, when we meet people who have been persecuted for their faith, like actually persecuted, actually threatened, actually disowned by their family, we, we realize the costs of, of being a Christian. And, and so, so with, with, with all that in mind, it's, it's really hard to, to, to believe in a prosperity gospel. But yet, we see both these, these things in Scripture. And so, how can we weigh these two sides of Scripture together so it's not either or, but it, instead it's both and, and more? I think Paul sums it up really well in Philippians 4, verse 11 to 13. He says this, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul's saying whether in need or in plenty, on either side of the spectrum, Paul's secret of contentment is Christ who gives him strength. I mean, there, there's, there's rich people in this world who are far from living an abundant life. And, and there's poor people in this world who are living the most abundant life. It's not dependent on our circumstances. It's dependent on, on Christ in our lives. When I think of abundance that comes from God, I think of an abundance of strength and peace and wisdom and love and grace and joy. And, and that's not to say that God doesn't provide financially ever. You know, God has and does that throughout Scripture. And, and in my own life, I've experienced the goodness uh, of God through this. This one time uh, before, uh, when I was a, just probably like 19 or 20, I was trying to tour as a musician. And uh, my guitar, my $1,000 guitar that I just bought, got stolen in Vancouver. Ah, oh, those Vancouver people. Uh, and I was super choked. That was a lot of money for me back then. And, and a month later, I was in Hamilton playing and... Um, Anyway, this, this lady came up to me and she said, uh, I think God's telling me to give this to you. And uh, she put something in my hand. I was like, oh, sweet, maybe like 50 bucks, maybe, maybe something like that. And, and I opened it up and it was a check for $1,000. And I was just blown away. And, and I've definitely seen God provide financially. Um, and, and seen the goodness of God through it. So it, it's not to say that God doesn't provide things. But it is to say that our reason for following God should never be to get things. The prize for following God is to get God. The prize for following Jesus is Jesus. It's the best gift. It really is. And all these other amazing things that he gives us are just little cherries on top. Compared to knowing and being loved by Jesus Christ. And I love this Tim Keller quote. He says, religious people obey God to get things. Gospel people obey God to get God. And it's my prayer that we'd be gospel people. Yeah. Okay, so, so we've unpacked kind of the theology behind uh, abundance, hopefully. And, and, and we should get started now. Okay? This is, the preliminary is over. This is good. Okay, we're all kind of on the same page when we're talking about abundance, hopefully. We're kind of weighing things. Um, yeah, and, and God kind of laid this on my heart um, when I was in Iraq. And, and I think because I had a real fear in my heart of not wanting my walk with Jesus to resemble the prosperity gospel at all, the word abundance in a lot of ways made me uncomfortable. 
It would not be something that I would ask God for. And, and so I didn't. Um, but, but recently I've come to know that, that he is a God of abundance and he gives good gifts to his children. So it's okay to come to God and ask for more than enough of something. And, and I would go as far as saying he's delighted when we do so. So the question now is not whether or not we should ask for abundance. The question is, what should we do when we receive abundance from God? And, and so today I want to look at two points. Um, when God brings any abundance or good thing into your life, do these two things. Number one. Be thankful, praise God, enjoy it. It's, it's really that simple. I don't have anything more to say. Be thankful, praise God, enjoy it. And, and number two, and, and we're going to spend a little bit of time on this, serve others with it. Has God given you an abundance of musical talent? Serve others with it. Has God given you an abundance of knowledge? Serve others with it. Have you been blessed with free time or wealth or spiritual gifts? Serve others with it. Jesus uses his abundance and, and, and his abundance of power and his abundance of knowledge in an incredible way. And it's all about serving others. Um, why don't you turn with me? We're going to go to Matthew 4 just really quickly. Just at the beginning. You guys there? Cool. Let's start. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Yeah. <laughs> The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. And, uh, yeah, I think, I think there's so much you could draw from this scripture. It's so, so rich, and it's amazing to see Jesus' knowledge of the word of God coming, uh, being so important. It's interesting that, that Satan knows the word of God, too, and he just kind of mis, misquotes it, maybe quotes it out of context a little bit. Um, I think oftentimes we think of the temptation in the desert as a time that Jesus had to go through so he could relate to our struggles. I've, I've heard it being, been taught like that before. You know, in the desert, he experienced the temptations that we go through and he overcame them. And that was kind of the point. And, and while I agree, I think that the temptations were much more than that. You know, Jesus was fully God, fully man. And I think as he walked this earth, every day he faced the temptations that we face. You know, he, every day he, he was faced with the, with the choice. Maybe he could covet or, or kill or lust or steal. Um, but the temptation in the, des- in the desert, I think, was a final preparation test from God, um, specific to Jesus, but before he started his ministry. And, and of course, it was Satan doing the tempting. Um, God never tempts people to sin, but it's interesting to me how God set things up. After all, it was the Holy Spirit that led Christ out to the desert. And and I believe God's primary purpose of leading Jesus into the scorching desert sun for a brutal 40-day fast without food or water was all based around this question. How was Jesus going to use his abundant, unlimited power? I mean, look at the temptations. They're not normal human temptations. Have you guys ever been tempted to make a rock into a loaf of bread? I mean, I haven't. 
Or, or to jump off a building and command angels to catch you? It's like Jesus bungee jumping, except you just don't have the rope. I mean, he could have done it. He could have done it. Uh, and, and man, would it have been a sin if Jesus had turned a rock into a loaf of bread? I mean, the Old Testament law doesn't mention anything about not turning rocks into bread. I think Jesus might have been okay. Um, Maybe he would have been going against God's fasting orders. Maybe the fast was done at this point. Anyway, all that to be said, I I think ultimately it was the temptation of how would Jesus use his power? Would, Would he use it to benefit himself or would he use it to benefit others? Oftentimes we say that absolute power corrupts absolutely. Historically, more or less, for people who have had mass amounts of power, how have, how have they used their power? It's normally to benefit themselves, right? And they, they normally exploit people, uh, and they use their, their power, um, yeah, really for their own personal gain. And, and here in this point of history was a man with more absolute power than anyone who has ever walked the earth. Would he be corrupted? How would he use his power? And the answer was he would use his power in the most amazing way, not to serve himself, but to serve others. All throughout his life, we see Jesus do that. And, and this, <laughs> this is, uh, <laughs> sometimes I have like little funny notes in, in, in my sermons and I'm not, should I read that? That's kind of dumb. Uh, but I was wondering to myself this week if Jesus ever got a cold and healed himself or if, ever, or if he just like toughed it out, you know? What did he do in that situation? Or, or maybe he was hungry and just made himself a pizza pocket out of thin air. You know, just like... Psh. I don't know. Part of me, though, imagines that he didn't, actually. It, it's weird. I just feel like, like he, he didn't want to cross the line of, of using his power to benefit himself. I think, I think he's always using his power to benefit others. Yeah. God knew that Jesus being fully God and fully man would be in a very unique position. He would have unending power and the ability to use it any way he wanted to. And the question was and is, how would Jesus use his power? God the Father and God the Son both knew that the cross was set before Christ. They both knew that Jesus would be whipped, beaten, and crucified beyond human recognition. And they both knew that at any point during the whole whole ordeal... Of the cross, Jesus would have the power to stop it. You know, he could have said, enough of this taunting, enough of this agonizing pain, I'm out of here. One author wrote, Jesus could have done a miracle and come off the cross, but it's a greater miracle that he stayed. And why did he stay? Because Jesus decided that he wouldn't use his power and his position to benefit his own life, but instead to benefit ours. You know, in Matthew 26, 53 to 54, Jesus says to Peter, Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But then how, could, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? Jesus had access to call down thousands of angels to fight for him at any moment. He could have strayed from his father's will, but he didn't. He did his father's will. And what was his father's will It was that Jesus would come to serve, not to be served. He would come to serve sinful, proud man and die on the cross so that we could be forgiven by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus came to set people free from sin, guilt, and shame. And and, and Jesus didn't die on the cross so we could be just a little bit free. No, he brought us abundance uh, of freedom, abundant freedom, complete freedom. In Galatians 5, verse 13 to 14, Paul basically says, what is the point of all this freedom? He says, you, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. Use your freedom to serve one another. He's saying, use your finances to serve one another. Use your talents to serve one another. 
Wherever you have abundance in your life, what should you do with it? Serve one another. Give thanks to God. Give him praise. And and use your abundance, whatever it may be, to serve others. This is what Jesus did in the most amazing way. We're going to end by looking at 1 Kings uh, chapter 3. And uh, at this point, um, the band can come back up. You guys there? I'll also read it, so it's all good. It says this. The king, this is Solomon, the king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. It's a nice sound. Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. So he's remembering, he's, he's telling God what God has already done. Then he says, Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings." And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Then Solomon awoke and he realized it had been a dream. He returned to Jerusalem, stood before the ark of the Lord's covenant and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then he gave a feast for all his court. And and I love this scripture. We get to see Solomon's heart. And, And God gives him... This question, he says, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Man, that's amazing. And and what does Solomon respond with? Well, he he asks for wisdom. And, And why does he ask for wisdom? It's because he wants to serve God's people well. It's because he wants to be a good king. He wants to rule justly. He wants to to be able to govern them. He says, I'm just, I'm just a child and I do not know how to carry out my duties. God, will you give me wisdom so I can serve your people? And, and, and what's God's response? I, I love God's response. It says, God was pleased. And, and some translations say, God was delighted with what Solomon asked for. If God said to you this morning, ask for whatever you want me to give you, what would you ask for? I believe that our God is a God who gives good gifts. I believe many of us are, are maybe feeling weary and lacking, and God wants to remind us that he is a God of abundance. Jesus said, whatever you ask for in my name will be given to you. And, and so as we come to God today, we ask for his presence and goodness in our lives so that we may serve the people around us so that we may serve the city of Calgary, so that people might know our amazing God. And and so uh, we're going to just do two things just to end this service. One, I just, at this point, I just want us to be thankful for what God has given us, uh, because the truth is God has given us so much. You know, we live in Calgary, we have freedom. Um, There's just so much to be thankful for. So we're just going to sing a song of praise. Just, just worship the Lord. And then after that, we're, we're going to ask God. 
for, for abundance of, of whatever he lays on your heart. And there's going to be a mic up here. I just want you to pray it for, for yourself, but also for this church and also for, for the city of Calgary. And so is that, is that cool? Cool? Awesome. So why don't we stand, just, just give Jesus glory for all that he's done for us. He's given us his son, the greatest gift of all.